Good morning. How y'all doing today? Great. All right. We want to welcome you to Covenant Baptist Church today. Welcome you to worship. Uh, we're glad that you're here. If this is your first time, we're glad you're here. If it's your 100th time, we're still glad you're here. So um, we're going to pray. And there is no children's message today. So don't come up here, kids, or you have to go back. So if you'll join me in a word of prayer. Jesus, we thank you for today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity just to come together with this family and these people. We just pray that you would be here. You said where two or more are gathered, you'd be there. And so we just trust that you're here with us today, God. I pray you'd be with Clark as he brings the message. And I just pray that we can honor you today. In your name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand and greet those people around you, and then there's no children's message. Amen. As you make your way to your seat, please remain standing and join with us as we worship this morning. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the strong man boast in his strength. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let the humble come and give thanks to the one who made us, the one who saved us. I will boast in the Lord my God. I will boast in the one who's worthy. I will boast in the Lord my God. I will boast in the one who's worthy. He's worthy. Same thing again. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the strong man boast in his strength. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let the humble Come and give thanks to the one who made us, the one who saved us. Sing it out. I will boast in the Lord my God. I will boast in the one who's worthy. I will boast in the Lord my God. I will boast in the one who's worthy. He's worthy. And I will make my boast in Christ alone. And I will make my boast in Christ alone. And I will make my boast in Christ alone. Once more. And I will make my boast in Christ alone. Sing it out. I will boast. I will boast in the Lord my God. I will boast in the one who's worthy. I will boast in the Lord my God. I will boast in the one who's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He is worthy, isn't he? Amen. He is worthy. Oh 
From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful untamable all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing God. who has told every lightning bolt where it should go or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow Imagine the sun and give sorts to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing. All powerful, untamable, all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing, God. Indescribable, uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing God incomparable unchangeable you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same you are amazing You are amazing. God. He is amazing. When you think about all he's done, he imagined the sun, right? Imagines it himself. I couldn't have. But he did. And this same awesome God we can stand before this morning and be unashamed of all the things that we've done wrong. As hard as that may be, and as hard as that is to understand. But through the blood of his son, Jesus, he made a way for us to stand right in front of him unashamed. Great concept that we should be grateful for. Amen. And I have not much to offer you, not near what you deserve. But still I come because your cross has placed in me my word. Oh, Christ, my King, of sympathy whose wounds secure my peace your grace extends to call me friend your mercy sets me free and i know i'm weak and I know I'm unworthy to call upon your name. 
but because of your grace and because of your mercy i stand here on a shame I can't explain this kind of love. I'm humbled and amazed that you come down from heaven's heights and greet me face to face. And I know I'm weak. And I know I'm unworthy to call upon your name. But because of your grace and because of your mercy, I stand here unashamed. Here I am. At your feet In my brokenness complete Here I am At your feet In my brokenness complete Here I am At your feet in my brokenness complete and i know i'm me and i know i'm unworthy to call upon your name but because of your grace and because of your mercy, I stand here unashamed. And I know I'm weak, and I know I'm unworthy to call upon your name. But because of your grace, and because of your mercy, I stand here unashamed. Father, we thank you that we can stand before you this morning unashamed of all the things that we've failed you with in the past through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, they've been wiped clean, and we thank you and we praise you. And God, help us to be reminded of that each and every day as we feel failure in our lives or we feel that we can't live up to what you'd have us live up to. Help us to remember that, God, our, your mercies are new every day. And Lord, we can stand before you unashamed and serve you and allow you to use us. We love you, Lord. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to take just a moment, introduce Clark Johnson. I'm sure many of you already know who he is. He's going to be preaching for us today. Let's give him a nice warm welcome. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Hey, uh, what a privilege to be with you and spend some time sharing the word of God together, gleaning from its truths and allowing it to apply to our lives. Uh, it's a delight. Know many of you, and so it's fun just to kind of be back with you for a while in renewed fellowship. And then the additional friendship is always a blessing in our lives as well. And your pastor has become a dear friend in my life, and our friendship is growing together. I appreciate him as a gentleman. I appreciate him as a preacher of the Word of God. It matters to Casey that he preaches the Word, and he preaches it correctly. And I know that you like to uh, glean from his ministry, and rightly so. Uh, it's, and he loves you, and I know you love him, so it makes it fun being around both of you. And it's a really good match. Uh, I want you to just stay with me this morning on a real key thought, and uh, if we can take away this one central truth, key thought, it can be for us a life-changing experience because it may well change the way 
we make our decisions from this point on. I'm going to be reading from John, the 21st chapter. I encourage you to get the word out. Um, we don't have it on the overhead, but that is because I gave them the wrong scriptures. Uh, these folks have been fantastic, and uh, you, you notice that you don't have any notes there, uh, as you typically do to go follow your pastor with notes, and um, it, it kind of it's because uh, I don't preach from notes, and so I didn't have any to write out, but I hope you have a space there you can write down and jot down a few of the truths and a few of the scriptures as well. So just kind of stay with me, relax for a moment, and then answer this question for now, I don't want you to answer it out loud, and I don't want you to move and nod your head, because uh, it, it may seem like I'm setting you up, and I'm not, but it's a complex answer. Here it is. Do you love God? Now, don't be quick. Do you love God? Well, if the answer is no, that's good enough. If the answer is yes, that's not good enough because it's not a yes answer. Christ has told us the answer and the parameters of the answer. And we have to operate within the parameters of His answer. So simply I can say, yes, I do love God, but that's not sufficient. We are readily, we are readily, and rightly so, willing to tell people that God loves them. In fact, we hear it all the time, don't we? We share that message as often as we can. For God so loved the world. We are, we are eager to share that God loves us. We are eager to share that God loves mankind. How often have you told somebody how much you love God? When was the last time you specifically, intentionally, you told somebody that you love God? Yeah, we tell people that God loves us, but when was the last time you intentionally told somebody that you love God? When was the last time you told God that you love God? Was this important? Yes, it's important. You want to make sense of all this? What's all this? Creation. You. Being here, life, uh, the universe, why we exist, what's going to happen, what's the future. And you all pondered those questions. You all tried to make sense out of everything that's going on. And rightly so. But in the midst of all of this, let me give you a foundation whereby you can begin to formulate and put together that which you can apply in your life and decision making. And that is this. God wants you to love Him. And he created all of this so that you and I would love him. Now I know he loves us. Yes, for God so loved us that he gave us this unique, one-of-a-kind gift, Jesus Christ. And if you've asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, to forgive you of the sin of unbelief, and to take lordship of your life, give it purpose and function, that's so you now have the ability to love God. In my brokenness, in my sinfulness, my relationship with God is so impaired, I can't acknowledge Him as God. I don't recognize Him and love Him. And God wanted me to love Him. And so God put this wonderful Jesus in my life to forgive me of the sin in my life and the sin of unbelief, to cleanse my life, to put a Holy Spirit in my life. He gave me the Word of God. He gave me the church. He gave me Christian friends so that I could be transformed. Transformed to what? Transformed to one who now can love God. Transformed into one now that looks like the God that loves me. The angels marvel at this relationship. They've never had this relationship. And when they see how much trouble God has gone through just so that we would love Him, they marvel at it, the Scripture said. The Scriptures call you a trophy. God's going to display you as a trophy, as somebody who loves Him. Now, you just take a moment and look at creation. Of course, it's mind-boggling. No, our minds shut down. We can't go to the beginning of nothing. Our minds don't go there. We're not capable of wrapping around that thought. But I was reading the, just the other day, and uh, of course we are part of the Milky Way. 
The Milky Way is 590 quadrillion miles across. Now, if you have my truck, it's going to cost you a lot to get there. How long is it? How far is that? You're right. That means nothing to us, does it? But if you could, if I could put 590 and it would be followed by 10 zeros around there, that's the length of our Milky Way. Our Milky Way is just one of what is estimated as 1.7 billion galaxies. And we're just one. Wow. Now, now, now that is overwhelming to me. But here's what really struck me. That God that created all that wants you specifically to love Him. And part of the creation was that we would recognize that there is a God worthy of that kind of love. Oh yes, and it's interesting of course, and there's a real movement and it's intensifying so that we can negate the fact that God is the Creator. Now you're called foolish if you believe that. You're not intellectually astute if you believe that God is the Creator of it. We know that it's a big bang and it all started and it just kind of happened and it's all put together over a lot of years. And if you don't believe that, you're not intelligent. But let me tell you folks, if you believe that, you're foolish. doesn't surprise me that Satan wants to nullify that or to minimize that or to make you sound foolish because you believe it but God put part of that there just so you would love him is it important that you say yes I love God sure it's the object of your salvation it's the object of the creation it's the object of God in purpose what's the second commandment you're right. The second commandment is that you shall love God. You have no other gods before Him. No idols, nothing. In fact, if you put anything before God, you love anything other than that God, you'll be punished. But He said, He rewards those who love Him for many generations. The second commandment is you should love God. Not an option. It's not something that I w kind of work myself into when I want to or adjust as I'm moving through my Christian life it is a command that you love God they were speaking to Jesus and they said well there's a lot of commandments out there Lord uh, what's the greatest commandment of all and Jesus said what you are to love God there's a command not an option if I can work it in no you are to love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now there's a foundation, if we can wrap our arms around that, is going to give us a reason and a purpose for being here in Jesus Christ. To love God, and from that love of God, I develop a correct relationship with my neighbor and a correct relationship with myself. Based on what? The love of God. We spend very little time loving our Lord. We do spend a lot of time telling that He loves us. That's wonderful. We have worship. Worship was created for us to stop and tell God thank you. They brought their sacrifices. They offered a sacrifice in obedience. They worshiped. They sang praises. Our worship and your worship today should be a time in your life when you stop and you say thank you to God. We clear our thoughts of the encumbering world that kind of restricts us and you just kind of take a deep breath and you begin to sing and you think, no, I really do love this God. I really do love this God. God, thank you, thank you for being my God. Unfortunately, many times, and it's happened in American culture, today's church worship is about us. What makes me feel good? What energizes me? What kind of music do I like? It's all about us. And if I can find something that really makes me feel good the way I want to worship, then, then I'll be okay. Worship isn't about you. Worship is you saying thank you to God. Worship is you uniquely and distinctively severing yourself from the hecticness of the world and focusing on, thank you, thank you, Lord, for saving me and being Lord of my life. There's another time in Scripture 
where this question was asked. And we can glean from this, folks, and it is overwhelming in its truths. And it is true for you and I in our decision-making of life. When we join the 21st chapter here of John, we're going to be with the disciples, a few of the disciples. This is the third time that the resurrected Lord has appeared to the disciples. Now keep that in mind. Wouldn't you be blown away if you got to see Jesus Christ literally after his crucifixion? You could fellowship with him, you could glean from him. And you were in the presence of Jesus Christ. I mean, wouldn't that just absolutely be an amazing experience to you? All right, that's what's happened. And now we join in this particular decision-making in the 21st chapter. And it starts out this way. Uh, this is the second time that they've come together. And in the third verse there, it says this. Peter is responding to the other disciples. I'm going out to fish said Simon, Peter, and he said it to them, and they said, you know what, hey, we'll go with you. So they went out, and they got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Most of the time we read that, we emphasize that night they caught nothing. Let me tell you what really is amazing here. This Greek phrase, I'm going fishing, it means I'm going back to do what I was doing. I'm going to go into the industry of fishing. I'm going to become a fisherman of fish. The other two disciples, three disciples said, you know, I think we'll do that too. Whoa, wait a minute. Weren't these the ones that were called to follow Jesus Christ, to take and launch the gospel to the world? Wasn't through them going to be the spreading of the good news of Jesus Christ and the teaching and equipping for people that would all, for all time know Christ as Lord? The followers of Jesus, they're now saying, we're not going to be followers of Jesus. We're going back to our old lifestyle. We're going back to do what we did before. The boat that is there, that's Peter's boat. The Greek is very, uh, it gives a possessive noun, that's Peter's boat. I thought they sold everything to follow Jesus. Well, Peter didn't. He kept the boat maybe just because if it didn't work out. It's Peter's boat. Peter's going back fishing. Christ has a message to teach. He has to ask them some very pointed questions. There are times in your life when the decisions you have to make, my friend, have the same magnitude as this decision. But the principles say, regardless of the magnitude of the decision. All right? So let's see how Christ deals with us when we have this decision-making time in our life. And you have them all the time, but some of them are just life-changing. But this dealing in the relationship with Christ is the same. We go on and it reads there that, uh, well, they didn't find anything. Christ shouted out from the shore, told them to put the net on the other side. That was not uncommon, by the way. Oftentimes they had spotters and the Sea of Galilee is so crystal clear. They would go up on the, on the cliffs and they would look out and they could see the school of fish and they would guide the fishermen out there. So they responded. That's why they did. That was just a normal thing for professional fishermen. Well, they got and they put it on the other side. Of course, it was overwhelming uh, the number of fish that were in there. Now, here, I want... I want the other disciples um, stayed in the fish, uh, stayed, excuse me, with the boat. Uh, but Peter got out, and when he landed, he saw a fire burning with some coals there, and there were fish on it and some bread. Just a little insert there. He sees a coal fire. You remember the last time, at least of interest, where Peter was by a coal fire? Remember when Peter denied Jesus Christ? He was warming his hands on a fire of coal. God is setting this up for clarity. He's going to let that smell refresh in Peter's mind. You denied me. You said that you loved me. You said that you wanted to follow me. No, you lied. You denied me. Does this remind you of that statement? Now you say you're going back fishing. I've got some questions to ask of you, Peter. You notice that there was fish on the fire already, but he told them to bring some fish. 
Why? Again, he is going to use all the resources so we understand how important it is our decision making. He's going to have in his hands some fish. He said he was going back fishing. I got some questions to ask. You're holding these fish. I got some fish for you to eat by a fire that's going to remind you of where you denied me. Peter, let's look at that and see that you understand how I'm working in your life. Well, they came ashore, and I, you know, I, I, every time I read this, I just smile. Somebody counted the fish. You're in the middle of a miracle. Fish are busting out everywhere. And somebody counts 153 fish. Come on, whose life is so boring that they would sit down and ca- count 150? The only people that I can think of, and this is great respect, I hope somebody's not here, it was probably a minister of education. <laughs> they count everything and everybody no matter what, right? That's their job. And I just always found that humorous that somebody took time to count the number of fish in the midst of this net and the miracle. Now we come to the decision-making time, and now Christ is going to work with Peter. I'm in the 15th verse. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these. Well, what's he holding in his hand? Holding some fish. He's going back fishing. And the question is, what? Did you catch it? The question was, Peter, do you truly love me? It didn't ask him, hey, what are you doing? You're going fishing or you're going out uh, to be part of my work? That was not the question. All these questions in our lives, my friend, each time the dramatic situation in your life or the routine situation in your life, the question doesn't start with the answer. The question always starts with this. Do you truly love God? Then we can follow with whatever comes next. We jump right to whatever comes next. We get right in the crisis. We get right in the question, and we don't stop to solve the real issue is do you truly love God? Notice that word truly because the word says there are many, many, many who call me Lord and I don't even know you. So it's not calling Lord, Lord is the issue here. It's whether you truly love Christ as Lord and Savior of your life and you've asked that Jesus for a transformational relationship so that you can love Him and you can love God. He said, Peter, do you truly love me? And then notice, by the way, that the answer is, that's not, yes, I do, Lord, or no, I don't. All right? Not from Christ's perspective. The Scripture said, now gets this. When the Scriptures ask us if we love God, it's followed by, if you love me, then you keep my commandments. It's not a yes or no answer. He defines our love for us. If you love me, keep my commandments. That means if I really, truly love my Jesus, I'm in that passion of life to obey Him. Oh yeah, I'm going to stumble. I'm going to make some poor decisions. I'm going to disobey Him. But my bent on life, my passion for life, is to be obedient. And when I make those decisions that do not glorify them, you get down on your knees, you ask Christ to forgive you, you restore the fellowship so you can continue the relationship of you loving God. But if you love God, you can keep His commandments. If you love God, what did he say you do? If you love me, then you feed my lambs. See, that's not multiple choice. It's not maybe I love you and I'll think about serving you. Maybe I love you and I'll think about feeding your lambs. Maybe I love you and and, and, and I'll think about obeying you. You know how he responded? Like many of us respond oh Lord you you know I'm appreciative of you you're really a good Jesus thanks for everything you do and and thank you Lord because I'm going to heaven 
when I die, I'm going to heaven. I really love that. Thanks, Lord. You paid that price for me, and I, and I really do appreciate you. He said, I didn't ask you if you appreciated me. I said, do you devotionally, submissively love me more than these? And you and I can put the these in our lives. And if the answer to that is yes, then we feed his sheep. If the answer to that is yes, then we obey him. Because all of this whole scheme of reality is so that you and I will love God. Well, they do that same thing again, as you know. Simon, do you, come on, you're not getting this. Do you truly love me? Well, yeah, Lord, you know I'm fond of you. You, you know that. You're not getting this, Peter. You're just not getting it. Take care of my sheep. The third time, do you really love me devotionally, submissively? And uh, really, truly do. And he was kind of sad because he knew the gap in the relationship. But Jesus said, Peter, I'll take you right where you are. And right now, you're not even sure you love me devotionally. But one day you'll die for me. And because this walk between you and me and this you following your Jesus is so that you become madly in love with your father. And when you become madly in love with your father, you feed his sheep. When you become madly in love with your Jesus, you obey him. And here's how you make decisions as believers. And we need to make decisions as believers. When we have to make those difficult decisions or any decisions of life, you start with this. Do you love God? You see, what happens is, when I love my Jesus, he had those fish in front of him. He was talking to them about people. When I love the Lord with all of my heart and all of my soul... I began to love my neighbor as myself. So the key factor is the correct love of Jesus, is it not? Then I can relate to my neighbor correctly and love him. What happens is this. When we fall in love with our God, when we fall in love with our Jesus, we now love what he loves. Let's repeat that. We now love what he loves. He said, I want you to love me with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. So now that I'm falling in love with God, I'm going to have the correct relationship with my neighbor because I love my Lord. And Christ said, I've come into this world because I love your neighbor and you. For God so loved the world that you and I can fall in love with, not looking at the world. He didn't tell us to love sheep. He said to love him. And I will fall in love with what he loves. And I will serve that. We had an a older couple in our church. And um, they'd been married, I don't know how many years, yeah, like 50, 60, and... and uh, a lot of years, and I'd visit him once in a while, and, and um, the wife wasn't in real good health. You go visit them and sit down. They had this this thing they called a dog. It's about this big, and and I'm not even sure that it didn't think it was a dog, but it was just one of those things, you know, annoying, jump all the time, hyperactive, you know, needed some kind of medication. It was just one of those kind of dogs. And she was absolutely crazy about this dog. This dog was in her lap. This dog followed all the way around. This dog was everywhere with her. And she even thought it was a dog. It was that bad. It was that serious. He couldn't stand that dog. Didn't want that dog anywhere near him. And the dog knew that he didn't like it. And if the dog came his way, he was gentle. He wasn't brutal. He didn't slap the dog, but he'd push the dog away. And uh, he never took the dog out, didn't feed it, couldn't care if it ever ate. She uh, had a very rapid, advanced cancer and um, died. And I went back to visit him. Yeah, it must have been 
this time, about three months, went in and sat down, and that stupid dog was still there. I thought for sure that dog would be in the pound. Or worse. That dog got up in his lap. He held that dog. He talked to that dog. It was amazing. And it dawned on me. Did he love that dog? No. He loved his wife. And he loved what she loved. So he took care of it. It's exactly the image that's being given to us here. If you love me, feed my sheep. I didn't ask you if you love sheep. I ask you if you love me. And we fall in love with our God, then we love what our God loves. And we have value to our God. And then I use that in every aspect of life. We close with this verse. First Thessalonians it says this. Be joyous always. Pray continuously, giving thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Give thanks always. Why? That's God's will. Most of the time when we read that, we look at the circumstances. And then we make our decision whether I can give thanks or not. These circumstances are overwhelming. Pastor, you don't understand the pain. You don't understand the heartache. The loss of my child, the loss of the job, uh, the loss of a spouse... It's just endless, or the, or the heartache of a tornado, or some kind of disaster, and hundreds of lives, and, and, and wait a minute, you're telling me i got to give thanks in the middle of this? Look at this stuff, and, and I don't know that I'll ever be able to forgive that guy, what he did to my daughter. I don't know if I'll ever be able to forgive that drunk guy that ran over my son. Are you, you, that's what you think I'm going to give thanks for? No. Not at all. In every circumstance, we can tell God we love Him and we thank Him for being our God. And then call upon that God to guide us through the circumstance. Then call upon that God to sustain us regardless of what the circumstance is. So in every situation of life, if I go to my God first, if I fall in love with my God first, then I claim that love of that God who can fortify me to get through that event. I may never change my opinion on the heartache of the event. It may never make sense. It could be totally senseless. I'm not thanking God for the circumstances. I'm thanking God for being my God. I'm thanking God that I can love Him. And that God said that He would sustain me. He would be my power. He would be my resources. He'd get me through this. He didn't say take away my heartache. That would be a bonus. He did say that through all of this, I could stay in love with Him and be of value to Him in the midst of those circumstances. Where does it start when you start talking to God? Do you start listing all your needs? Are you angry? Are you trying to direct him how to be God? Are you telling him if he'd really be great if he did this? Or if he did that? You know where we start? Lord, I love you. I truly love you. You're awesome. You have forgiven me through Jesus Christ. You have given me life. Through all of my existence, I will be able to love you. Now, I'm going to use that love in making decisions for my life today. And he said, you obey me. He said, feed my sheep. Real quick, just want to tell you about an opportunity that you could have to feed the sheep. There's a ministry that's now in town, and it's a joint ministry between the Topeka Rescue Mission and an organization called NetReach. Basically, it is loving your neighbor as yourself 
because you are madly in love with God. And these are people that lives are broken. Many of them have come through homelessness or brokenness of some degree. Could be no matter what it is, a brokenness of some degree. But there are some people out there that would like to change. And they'd like to have some hope. But they don't know how. And they don't have anybody to guide them through that process. These are single mothers. These are couples. These are single individuals. There are children involved. There's youth involved. But they want somebody to help them through the process. God gave them to us. And we are to love them. Which means we treat them correctly. And we work with them correctly. You see, government programs, and I do not berate those, government programs bring about change, if possible. But they can't bring about transformation. So the people come right back into the situations again, or they operate in the same system they did before because they don't have a new one. We're talking about neighborhood empowerment transformation. How can somebody be transformed well, the only way, you're right. You're exactly right. The only way somebody be transformed is by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings about transformation. You're correct. Well, how do we get the Holy Spirit into their lives? Ah, if we had the followers of Jesus who were truly in love with Jesus in their life, we now have the Holy Spirit in their life. And that Holy Spirit has the opportunity to be released and bring transformation to them. Here's the beautiful part about this, folks. You can do this. Are you capable of loving your neighbor? That means dealing with them correctly. You can do this. It takes time, and it takes love, and it takes patience. But you'll be brought together with a team. And this team is going to build a mentoring foundation for people who want help. And right now, we have people that want help, and we don't have enough people to help them. We need some of you who's saying, yes, I love the Lord. I really do. And he said, feed my sheep. That's not by accident, see. That's not just a statement as a, as a point of infant. It is a reality to you and I that God has been blessing and we fall in love with him. I'm going to encourage you to understand that, that you won't be left alone. You'll be on a team. There's going to be supervision. There's a structure around us. And we're going to work as a team and function as a team. We're going to keep in contact with each other. These people are in a situation that's kind of structured. We've got to help them get through that. We don't solve problems. We teach them how to solve problems so they can be transformed. What it takes is you just to take a little time to love them. You say, you don't know how busy I am. No, I don't. But we all have the same number of hours in every day, just what we choose to do with them. Uh, you can go out to uh, netreach.org online, and you could register and fill out that information, and we would contact you and spend time explaining the program to you, and you will be taught, you will be equipped, and you will become a part of the team. Or if you would like some information, we can give you a little on your way out here uh, this morning. But think about, hmm, do I love him? Yeah, what a great plan. Because see, Jesus wants these people to love him. Not just you. He wants these people to love him. Make all your decisions first with this factor. Do you truly love God? And then go from there. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being so clear with your message. Thank you for clear with your love for us in Christ. And absolutely the command that we love you. May we take it seriously. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a challenging message. In uh, just a moment to reflect or think about. Pray about what God may have for you. Do you really love him? And Maybe it's this ministry or maybe it's something else. The altar is going to be open. It's going to be just a minute just reflect on what God shared with us through uh, Clark this morning.
Amen. I'm going to continue in worship this morning uh, through giving. And I believe, Craig, you're praying for us this morning. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just are in awe of who you are. And we do. We love you. Lord, you just shower your blessings upon us. And we just thank you for this opportunity that we can give back just a small portion of the blessings that you've given us, that what we give might go to enlarge your kingdom here on earth. Please bless the gift and the giver. We ask this in your son's most precious name. Amen. Are you guys ready for this? They didn't turn me on soon enough. What, you got, should we do that again? No, we won't. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Clark, thank you for bringing your message. Um, if you guys are interested in what NetReach is doing, we're going to have a meeting here on Tuesday, April 8th. We'll be here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. So if you want to come and find out, it'll t take about an hour probably less than that. Clark's a pretty quick speaker. If you guys noticed this morning, I don't know if you noticed that or not. Anyway, um, uh, so come to that meeting. It'll be informational and you can sign up for that then or go out and check it out on the web. We are doing the Annie Armstrong Easter offering uh, this week. The prayer week starts today. The purpose of this is to support North American missions and uh, our goal is 1500 as a church. Currently we have $905. 100% of that gift goes to missionary supplies and missionary salaries. Local missionaries that benefit from the Annie Armstrong offering are Josh and Tiffany Smart and their family with The Way. Richard Taylor, Debbie Carter, Matt Mastis, Roxy Hansen all serve with the Flint Hills Baptist Association. Uh, on April 26th, we're doing a spiritual gifts workshop, and there's a sign-up table out in the foyer or in the hallway, somewhere out there. Get signed up for that. Uh, and then Easter Egg Hunt will be April 19th from 2 to 4. Take the eggs, and uh, there are eggs out there. If you'll take the empty eggs and fill them up with candy um, and then bring them back. Also, they don't want candy that will melt. Um, and then bring those back. If you have questions, talk to Tammy Sanders and Betsy Litcher. They're looking for volunteers. Uh, the Lone Rock Mission trip this summer, June 7th through the 14th, we are going to Harrison, Arkansas to help build a church. Every year we partner with Lone Rock Baptist Church from Arkansas, and so plan on that. The dates are the 7th through the 14th. All right. How many of y'all knew that we had a newsletter? How many of y'all read the newsletter? All right. Well, there's a lot of information. Annette does, goes, does a lot of work to put that together every week or every month. So please read that newsletter. If you have any questions, please talk to us. You are dismissed. Have a great week.